Thank you, Simona, and thank you to the organizers. Um, I am really thrilled to be here um, and um, proud to be able to present to you a part of a project that um, I presented um, Slovenia, um, the Slovenian Pavilion at the Venice Biennial two years ago. Um, now, I've been really thinking a bit about uh, what was said today, and uh, the speakers announced the problematic extremely, extremely well. Um, and the stakes are quite high, I think, and I would, I would just make a short comment. Uh, I was recently at a conference uh, at Birkbeck in London, uh, where uh, Yugoslavia was discussed as, as a new potential model for, for the new left. So when we were talking about um, you know, the questions of whether it is an exhibition or a new political movement, um, you know, there, are, there are certain thematics that um, are very deep that need to be discussed, and I really hope that there will be time for questions at the end of today to, um, to speak more about them. Um, and why I'm mentioning art and politics is because um, we are seeing that the contemporary social political condition has brought about this very interesting stance that um, many practices, art practices of today, are taking on as a departure point for creation and realization of new artworks. Um, and basically many artists are turning to the study of these past ideological and um, historical models in various fields to question the um, history and um, you know, politics of our time, really. And there, there is the underlying question, which is of um, you know, the historical models, so which historical models are included and why within these artistic reappropriations, um, and how they are approached and uh, treated by the artists themselves, and what attitudes and methodologies are chosen. Um, so these are very, very pertinent questions. So in a way, we could ask that, um, you know, are there positions assumed by the artists, by the contemporary artists, or are there only propositions given? And um, these are the questions that bear even greater significance when the histories and ideological conditions that are revisited are those that have not been adequately dealt with um, by society and institutions, by the official history writers of, of a people or a nation state. And this is why you know, quite a great example is this revisitation of, of modernism um, in the former East. Because um, in a way, and in many instances, it has entered the international uh, art arena, um, initially via the contemporary artists' uh, revisitations, formal reappropriations, and so on. And the theme was um, kind of almost historicized for the first time with these new fictions. Um, you know, before the architectural or art historical researchers and critics um, you know, have made their, their, their work. So th there's this underlying paradox of how to achieve this constructive research methodology as an artist, um, and what are the outcomes in these cases. Um, and uh, also when we're dealing with such thematic, you know, there's always this risk that it is of interest to the external observer, to the spectator, only because of the thematic that it deals with and of its potential geopolitical exoticism. Um, so I wanted to um, present to you, um, I should run, I'll just play in the background um, a short documentation from the Venetian project. So the title um, of, the, of the work was For Our Economy and Culture, which was um, a title taken from, uh, from an article um, uh, from the 1940s, which was uh, kind of problematizing um, the sort of typologies of national architecture at the time. Um, now, the basic gesture in the whole project was a kind of careful analysis of how national myth-making has been rewriting and reinventing the visual representation of nation-state. Um, so, by examining the architectural and artistic language um, that were endorsed by different authorities within a single territory, so this was all focusing on Slovenia, um, and um, you know, within different, different, um, in different time, um, and by uncovering almost what happened to this language, where it became redundant and often disturbing to the ensuing ideology. So whenever a new, a new national formation came within the Slovene territory, you know, there was always this erasure or uh, translation of the artistic language, of the architecture language, and so on. So the project was sort of dealing with these um, sort of repetitions of, of, of history, if you want. So the, 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 the work itself was not intended as this kind of illustration of nationhood or um, an illustration of political history. But I wanted to pose a question of how specific cultural and other icons that get selected by a nation state as representational 
deal with their potential reading as an element of soft power. So this sort of double game, what happens when art bites back, in a way. And it also posed the question of what happens to these icons um, when the ideology that gave them their initial almost sovereign status, if we go to a Gambon, um, disappear um, or is evacuated. So all the elements of the project were not only describing um, a system of political authority, but they entered the, the physical space of this political, political authority itself, and they used the elements of this very system. So they used um, um, a collection of artworks from within the Slovenian parliament, uh, which you also see in the film here. Um, they included, uh, the project included films shot within um, official state um, architecture, the Slovenian parliament, Villa Blit, and so on. So there was kind of this reversal of the na nation state's usual treatment of artistic practices that are otherwise used as an illustration of the political correctness, democracy, other pillars of nation making, if you want. Um, and it was kind of like a reclaiming of space. Um, so I, I want to talk a bit more about these um, power structures of um, nation states and its display mechanisms. So how do these displays uh, function? How is the architecture chosen to represent? How is the art chosen um, that inhabits these this, this spaces? Um, so within the project, as, as I kind of briefly mentioned, I was focusing on um, extreme localisms. So everything that entered into the project's language um, was from the territory of, 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 this, of the Slovenian Republic um, through time. And when I was looking at the architecture, I, I stumbled upon this very interesting first article entitled For Our Economy and Culture, which was dealing with um, the idea of um, the first um, organized presentation of national production in the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. And this was the first architecturally organized and cohesive uh, trade fair. This was a plan by Vico Glantz in Ljubljana. It was, this was in 1941. For obvious reasons, it wasn't finished and constructed. Um, and uh, I started looking into Glantz a bit more. And uh, um, Nika Graber was um, the, the kind of main um, uh, interlocutor on this project, on the architectural part, because uh, until her um, uh, massive PhD on this architect, there was hardly anything written. About, about him, and I will come back to this because it's, I think, quite an important thing. Um, so, um, Glantz was not a hero, you know, we're talking about heroes, and this is, this is what really, really kind of perturbed me. So, he wasn't this sort of great star modernist architect about whom, you know, articles would be written and so on, yet his function was, you know, was basically translating the state, you know, so it was extremely important. So, what he had to do was he had to reinvent the language itself. Um, so not only the form, and, and this is this is this this this, this uh, paradox that I was quite quite interested in. So all his buildings were um, well, hardly hardly any of the kind of the larger projects were um, new builds. They were mostly termed extensions. So the Slovenian Parliament is legally termed an extension um, or rebuilds and so on. And uh, you know this this was quite quite phenomenal for me. You know, kind of really thinking about this question of how an artistic language is used, um, you know, to translate the, the visual form, you know, for, for this new new ideology that comes. Um, so I was using um, these structures uh, of glands for um, for uh, different artworks, and here they became um, actual vitrines to um, to show to to you know to represent uh, really represent. And what what they were representing was. Um, this other um, um, idea, this other sort of uh, failed myth, if you want, or failed icon that I kind of decided to focus on. And this was, um, this is basically an endemic Slovene beetle, which is uh, unfortunately named after Hitler. So um, in a way, I kind of found this sort of entomological sort of nationalist blunder from Slovenia's past extremely, um, extremely interesting and entertaining in a way, because, you know, unlike her monuments and street names that, you know, we all know they can really easily be removed. Um, within within the, the idea of Latin names of animals and plants, we, we cannot, because of the linear classification, we cannot rename them. So they become the sort of living encyclopedias of, um, of, of past ideologies. So this beetle was discovered in 1933. So this is, you know, before you know, Hitler became the epitome of evil. Um, but, you know, still the, the, the person who named it was a Nazi sympathizer. And because of this name, the, the beetle um, sort of sank into the subconsciousness of the nation. 
and this is this phenomenon, this is where, you know, this kind of like uh, a little kind of flirtation then with this idea of these forgotten architectural scenarios kind of came into, into, into play. Um, and um, it's, um, it lives only in five caves and it's most numerous in a cave called Hell. So it, 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 it's kind of, you know, sort of, um, sort of, uh, story is not very uh, positive. And uh, what was so uh, interesting was that um, it, nobody really spoke about this phenomenon until 2006 when an article by National Geographic was written. And uh, they basically really made this connection with neo-Nazis and so on. And um, people really started to hunt it and um, it almost became extinct solely because of this name. So I worked with um, um, about 40 international entomological illustrators and we kind of did this, the story back. You know, we kind of said, well, if the name is so problematic, you know, let's look at how this beetle could look like. You know? So usually these illustrators illustrate something which is found and now we were and then name it, but now we were departing from the name. And this idea of this name giving, yes, you know, giving a name means giving love, you know, and this, this whole idea of why would somebody Name, um, name, name of a bug, a bug uh, Hitler was, was quite, um, quite interesting and it kind of sealed the, 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 the Beatles faith, if you want. So um, this, is, um, this is a wallpaper that we made out of all these illustrations. So these were all propositions for how this bug could look like. Um, and this became sort of like a background uh, of, the whole, of the whole project. Um, and um, as the architectural model for the project, I kind of wanted to go back to the kind of ultimate national authority itself, so the parliament. So here again we have Glantz, and this is, this is an amazing building, it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and um, it has a few very, very interesting uh, scenarios that happen, especially in the relationship of the viewer and the user of the building, and how, you know, and I was quite interested in then how this uh, art and architectural um, Sort of strategies kind of uh, played with this idea who is the viewer of this of this space who inhabits the you know this power structure and who is its viewer um, and um, so th these were just some plans that um, we were kind of looking at and um, again you know this was all um, um, loads of these materials uh, are not um, not sorted uh, loads of it is actually um, residing in a shopping trolley in a garage of his granddaughter so there was also this whole idea you know how do these histories get constructed who constructs them you know who stores them and you know then who tells the stories again who revisits them um, but uh, the phenomenon of this whole story was um, this debate of the power um, structure and uh, and art and uh, as you see here so the, this is the portal of, of the of the parliament um, I was really intrigued by these transcripts of these meetings between the politicians and the artists and the architect, you know, how this was debated, you know, how do we choose the, you know, interior, how do we choose the artists that uh, will, will be featured within the building itself. Um, and what is so phenomenal when one reads these transcripts is that art had a place at the table with the, you know, policy makers. And, you know, things that were debated were, you know, for how long an artist uh, can go to the seaside to get an inspiration and so on. So it's, a, it's quite a phenomen phenomenal um, sort of reading, uh, reading of, you know, art's positioning, you know, not as just an element of soft power, but as, you know, actually the one which is there that kind of co co-decides, co-drives the, the, the things. And, of course, it is, you know, there are power structures that sort of drive it, but, you know, um, it is taken very seriously, and that, that's the point. Um, now back to this whole um, thing about how, how uh, power structures, how uh, power structures and nation state um, treat the spectator. So this is the interior of the parliament, and you will see this very big sort of uh, dichotomy between the facade and the interior. This is almost like an Adolf Loos, you know, in a way. So there's this whole thing of like, you know, the, where the power resides, the interior needs to be, you know, comfortable, needs to be, you know, easy on the eye, needs to be something that, you know, the, the, the user of the space is, is, is used to and feels comfortable. Yet the, the facade, the forward-looking thing is for the spectator, it's for the citizens. So that has to emulate this idea of, you know, forward-looking nation um, and politicians. And then we come to, to the artworks themselves. So, um, as mentioned, um, you know, so before the, the idea of, uh, you know, of modernism in, in, in former Yugoslavia had this, of course, you know, the ideas of the local materials, local stone, local wood, and here we come to the local artists and to the representation and how power, how power can represent or, you know, how to represent the power. 
Um, and uh, so in the 50s, there was a call by the government to find these most representational national Slovenian artists to, um, you know, to make these artworks within the parliament. And uh, I decided to reappropriate these sort of uh, architectural strategies used by the architect um, and develop them for this national representation of the pavilion um, in, in Venice. And uh, basically what happened was that there were clearly designated spaces for the artwork, sort of niches, uh, there was specific cladding and so on, there were you know, spaces of, uh, you know, the, the theatrical spaces any parliament has that were sort of uh, devised and developed, and I was sort of kind of emulating them, if you want, with the exhibition design of the pavilion. Um, now the whole gallery was dressed in the same paneling and, um, and uh, a wallpaper that was covering the entire pavilion was, uh, was this uh, Hitler bug wallpaper. Um, so this was basically kind of setting the scene if you want. It was kind of a theatrical device, so I was playing with these you know, sort of um, tactics of creating theater. And uh, as for the lack of the narrative of you know, all this kind of research material and also of this performativity, we, we were briefly speaking today about performativity of power, and um, because this whole project was extremely performative in the background, so there was you know, lots of these negotiations with the state and so on, and I kind of wanted to emphasize this. So um, I borrowed the, um, the art collection from the Slovenian parliament, um, um, only still lives, only flowers though, because um, we were kind of looking for this emblem of the most benign uh, artistic statement that can be made and which will not be um, sort of exchanged by any new, um, any, any new, you know, sort of politician that comes to the office, you know, because it's kind of the easiest on the eye. And at the same time, you know, the, the flower arrangements are kind of almost like a souvenir of these protocolarian spaces, you know, they always reside on the sort of conference tables and so on. So we made this sort of performance of this hanging of the National Slovene Art Collection um, onto the walls of the Slovenian Pavilion. Um, and uh, paradoxically, um, the, the two things that uh, disappeared uh, from the Slovenian par uh, Parliament with the recession were the, um, the making of the art collection and uh, flowers on the, on the, on the tables. Um, and um, so we had these two dancers, again, dressed in the, same, in the same pattern. And I just wanted to quickly show you the in situ photos of this collection. So this, is, this is an incredible collection. It's absolutely priceless, absolutely gorgeous. Um, so this is a, a Richard Jakobic, three vases with flowers, 1935. And this is the cabinet of the president of the National Assembly, room 119. Um, and again, what is so amazing is it's a live collection. You know, it's not in the depot. It hangs, it hangs there, you know. Um, and sort of seeing these artworks within these spaces of power is also something quite, quite phenomenal because, again, you know, to the normal spectator, you know, um, these spaces are inaccessible, you know, so there's also this thing, and also when we look at all these works, you know, it's, it's about, you know, the context where they're hanging, where they were intended for, that uh, changes the nature of the artwork itself. Um, this is the room where the referendums are filed. Um, um, and this is uh, one of my personal favorites. So this is the office of the Department of the National Assembly for Material and Post. And I was uh, chatting with the ladies there. And they said, you know, we were just very tired of climbing up the ladder, changing the photograph of the president. So we put up some flowers that don't have to change anymore. Um, and this is, uh, this is one of the uh, offices of, uh, well, it's actually the office of the president of the National Assembly for Infrastructure and Space. Um, and yeah, just seeing these amazing artworks, um, you know, sort of next to these flags, and, and you know, it's, it, it really kind of gives this, this sort of, you know, this, it, it speaks back to this, you know, intention or, you know, um, you know, who, who, who um, designates the, the power for whom. Um, now, within the pavilion, uh, we shot and showed two films that were, um, one of them you can see here, um, which is uh, fr called Framing the Space, that was shot in uh, Villa Blade, um, which is one of Glantz's um, uh, sort of redesigns again. And these are the stills from uh, the second film, which was entitled The Fruits of Our Land, that uh, we shot in the Slovenian parliament itself, in one of the halls that is one of the uh, last ones, uh, the originals that were done by, by Vinko Glantz. Um, and uh, the script for it is um, uh, an exact um, translation of the, the actual meeting in 1957 when these artworks were being debated about. And um, um, they, they actually, you can get the book downstairs, the transcripts are also published. It's, it's a phenomenal debate because the, the artwork in question was called The Fruits of Our Land. It was supposed to be by Stupica. 
and uh, it was the, the, it was supposed to be depicting extremely benevolent figures of fruit sellers and children, um, and it was censored. So this was the, the only artwork, um, according to my research. I might be wrong, but according to my research, it was the only artwork that was um, that was censored within this um, this situation. There are just some images from the from the films. Um, now, framing the space just so you see the context, because here, of course, it's shown, it's shown differently. Um, the end effect of the film was this, you know, sort of um, melodrama type delivery of this quite theoretical text, which uh, I have written together with um, with a writer that usually works for the BBC, creating um, historical drama. So um, I was uh, I was extremely interested in this exactly this kind of the language of this exotification that that happens um, within these depictions of, of history. Um, now the building itself, uh, Villa Blade, was um, um, it, it started as an Austro-Hungarian hunting castle. Um, then it um, became the ownership of uh, of the king. Then uh, uh, Hitler even resided in it during the war. And then after the war, there's a very famous anecdote that um, Tito met with, with the architect and said, you know, all the other European presidents have flat roofs. You know, can we have a flat roof? And Glantz made this amazing flat roof. So, um, you know, and it kind of converted it into this sort of quite modernist looking, um, looking building. Um, and just to finish, I just wanted to, to, to point to the fact, which was very important for the film itself, is that the camera script of how the camera is moving through the building uh, was following um, the, the protocolarian services of the Slovenian state reclaiming the building. So the building was being run as a hotel, and on the day when we were filming, uh, the protocolarian services took it over. So there was this really nice sort of um, sort of delegated execution of artwork, if you want, you know, letting the prime minister, um, you know, design the camera script. Thank you.